it's Harlan Kilstein here, and I am thrilled to be here because I have a special guest, someone who is both a mentor as well as a friend. He is, by every standard, one of the top copywriters in the world, but even more than that, he is probably the top teacher of copywriting in the world. The list of people who he has personally mentored who have gone on to become the top um, copywriters at companies like Agora or um, people like Chris Haddad who have gone on to become legends in copy for his style. Many, many more people owe it to David. He has coached people and clients who have taken his advice and made hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of his career. A lot of people have talked about stories in copy. But I don't think anyone has broken it down as simply and clearly as David has in this book. It became literally, because of David's reputation, it became a number one bestseller on Amazon on the day of its release. So first question, David, what is the biggest scam about stories that work in business? Well, um, hi, Arlen. Thanks for doing this. And the biggest scam is that if you're going to use a story, especially in copy, it's got to be a hero's journey. A hero's journey, you know. What What's Joseph a hero's Campbell, journey? Yeah. So Joseph Campbell introduced the idea, and it's basically some great, fantastic story where you have an individual who is living an ordinary life, and all of a sudden they get thrown into this adventure where they have all kinds of tests and doubts and challenges and enemies and supporters. And it goes on and on. It gets very complicated. The stakes are high. At one point, it looks like all is lost. And then the hero, if it's a happy story, the hero breaks through, learns an important lesson, goes on to life, shares with the community what they've learned. Um, that works great in movies. You know, you think of an Indiana Jones or a Rocky or uh, any number of other blockbuster films works great in novels. Doesn't work so great in business. I mean, I was talking to a guy in Europe who was going to Paris to pitch multi-million dollar deals. And he said, I got about 20 minutes. So do you think he can tell a hero's journey? He's at the end of act one when the guy says, uh, time's up. It's it's not going to happen. Um, in so that's that's the big scam. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who should know better who are out there saying, yeah, it's got to be a hero's journey or you can't use it. And I'm saying in most cases, it's got to be anything but a hero's journey. I mean, think about Twitter. OK, on Twitter X, if you've got a blue check mark, you can go on and on. But. Up until recently, it was 280 characters. TikTok, you get, what, 59 seconds. Uh, Facebook, I was just talking to a very experienced YouTube advertiser. He said after about 45 seconds, he loses them. So that's not hero's journey. That's that's something else. And, and that's the kind of stories that we actually use all the time when we're writing copy, when we're selling, when we're talking to our husband or wife or partner about going to see a movie and we want to get them excited about, we tell these little persuasion stories. And that's what this book is about. Now, I got into storytelling through NLP. And in NLP, we had therapeutic metaphors. And I remember doing a lot of work with David Gordon, who was one of the founders of NLP, and the author of the book, Therapeutic Metaphors. And he did a lot of consulting in business. 
And I remember asking him, David, can you use therapeutic metaphors in business? And he said, you don't have the time to do that in business. If you're in a hypnosis session and the person is out and off drifting off in some place and you want to tell a 20 minute story or a 40 minute story, you can do that. But nobody's going to sit and listen to a 20 minute story in a business meeting. They don't have the time. They don't have the patience. And it's not going to work. Do you agree with him? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, if you are a professional speaker and people, their jobs depend on them sitting in a room and looking at you and pretending to be really interested. Yeah, maybe then. But in real life, you know, I mean, how many people rise to the top by learning to say, get to the point and, and, you know, scaring the hell out of everyone else because they need something fast. These are the kind of stories for somebody like that. I mean, these persuasion stories, um, some of them take less than a minute and um, they're, they're not tricky NLP sleight of mouth stuff. They're just the simple stories that we use every day. Now you gave examples at the very beginning of your book of, of different stories that a waitress might tell or a waitress might not tell. Um, Do you think that those telling the correct story would make a difference? Of course it would. Let me, let me give those examples because they're really pretty quick. Let's say you're going into this place called Marty's premium steakhouse and you're interested in the uh, filet. So you ask about it and you got, three different versions. First one, your server comes up and says, yes, we do serve filet mignon. It's a six ounce steak, one inch thick and three inches in diameter. Because it is a filet, there is relatively little marbling. It is grilled in our kitchen by first searing the steak at high heat and then transferring it to lower heat to get it to the correct degree of doneness. Like all of our steaks, it's USDA prime. Okay, that's pretty bad. It's not the worst, but it doesn't exactly get your mouth watering. Now, let me give you an example of a persuasion story. You ask the server, he gets this conspiratorial look in his eye, and he says, you must be a true connoisseur, because only people like that ask about the filet first thing. It is our most tender steak, and I'll tell you a secret. This is the steak that the chef's favorite, not only to cook, but when it's time for his dinner break, he'll ask for a filet if one's available. Marty, our owner, is famous among the restaurant owners in town, mostly because of his filet and also because of the paces he puts the meat guys through to get the first cut of their best steaks every day. I guess they don't like the pressure, but he keeps them in business, so they put up with it. That's less than a minute. There's actually three persuasion stories in there. Now let's try something else. You ask about the filet and the restaurant lights go down and pretty soon there's darkness, except on your server's face, there's a spotlight and you hear heroic music, probably by John Williams in the background. And your server begins speaking ominously to you in the movie guy baritone. Our filet is intimately tied up with what happened to Marty, the restaurant owner At age five, he was orphaned and sent to live with his aunt and uncle. When 9-11 happened, he was deeply moved by the real heroes of the day, the firefighters. From that point forward, Marty dreamed of becoming a fireman. But at age 14, he was kidnapped by a gang of outlaw restaurant owners, completely ripped away from the life he knew. Marty was held prisoner for five years by these people. His journey into the culinary underworld was brutal, practically indentured servitude. Strange customs and rituals. But the thing is, these outlaws really knew how to cook steaks. Breaking away from them was a big challenge, though. Now you're thinking, this is fascinating, but I didn't know they had dinner theater at this restaurant. And what was I going to order anyway? So the first one is like the guy's reading from a data sheet. The last one is like, the hero's journey but the middle one is persuasion stories that's the way 
real people, real persuasive people, business people, servers, CEOs, copywriters, salespeople. That's the way we talk when we want to persuade somebody in a minute or two or three, when that's all the time we've got. Is this something that people can learn or is this something that you're born with? You're a born persuader. You're a <laughs> born story storyteller. Boy, you know, Uncle Joe, he could really spin a yarn. You know, is it well, is this something that you can learn? Um, some people, it's going to be easier than another. But if a kid comes home from school and you say to him, "How is your day?" and he tells you what happens, then he can do this too, because this is the natural way we communicate. We tell stories. Salman Rushdie said, man is the storytelling, you know, the great author who was attacked on stage. Man is the storytelling animal. We're the only animal that understands life through our stories. We naturally tell stories. Now, to be a great virtuoso at this, you may have to be born at this or really work hard at this. But to do this in everyday life or in your emails or in you know, a sales presentation, you just have to do what you're already doing. You just need to learn to shape it and focus it, put a little intention in it a little differently. Now, you talk about stories and emails. Over the years, in my own unscientific study, I can tell that putting a story in an email has outperformed every other email that I have ever um, written. The most persuasive email doesn't come close to a story email. So who exactly um, should be telling stories? Well, Who's for, first of all, you're a natural storyteller. But see, you don't think of yourself that way, probably, right? You don't think of yourself as a storyteller, but you've been a counselor, you're a rabbi, you've been a teacher, um, you've done some sales. Um, so it's in your bones. It's it just it it's what you've always done. But why did your um why did that email perform better? There's actually a neurological reason. And I'm not a neuroscientist or a doctor, so I can't give you all the nitty-gritty, but there is something in our brains that when someone starts to tell a story, our pulse changes, our eyeballs dilate, our breathing slows, and we listen. And the thing is, we remember stories. We don't remember bullet points or persuasive arguments, but we remember stories. Because for probably anthropological reasons that we don't want to get into on this call, we're wired to do that. There's a great book called Wired for Story, by Lisa Crone, which explains all the neurology so that I don't have to. Um, who should do this? Everyone. Who can do this? Everyone. Is it going to take some practice? Yeah. Um, but so what? Um, it, it took practice to learn how to write emails. And, you know, um, every, every just, just about every top performing piece of copy I've seen has some kind of story in it. Not a hero's journey story, but a persuasion story for sure. I remember years ago when I introduced Alex Mandosian to Harv Ecker. Um, Harv had Alex come and speak there, and I told Alex to do something. Alex began all of his um, presentations with a story. And I added something to it that I asked him to do. I remember I asked Alex to order from the kitchen milk and cookies. And he had everyone come and sit on the floor in front of him out of their seats. And they passed out milk and cookies. And then he began. And to Harv's amazement and displeasure, Alex outsold Harv. And the edge was that when people sit down and they have milk and cookies, 
It is the best hypnotic regression to childhood that I could think of where they sat and listened to the parent or they sat and listened to the teacher and they were putty in his hands from that point on. What's your background in stories? <clears throat> well, my first, I wrote two stories when I was eight years old. <clears throat> One was a narrative story. Was it a hero's journey? Um. Uh, maybe it was pretty short. It was only about five or six paragraphs. It was called the billion, ten billion dollar duck. So okay. it was probably um, foreshadowed that I would be doing things about business, don't you think? And then I also wrote a story. I was um, having my breakfast cereal, um, post sugar snacks, and there was a contest on the back because Sugar Bear had stolen the beehive. And all the bees were coming after him. And there was a contest to figure out how he could get away with it. So, I mean, isn't the answer already obvious? I mean, isn't it so obvious? All he needed to do was put a bowl of sugar smacks at the other end of the meadow and run the other way. And all the bees would run to get sugar smacks because everybody loves sugar smacks. And... The executives at Post said, yeah, you win a sugar bear stuffed animal, boy. That's pretty good. So that was when I first started. You could see I had these, these twin types of stories in my future um, demonstrated there. When I was in New York in uh, the early 80s, I took a playwriting class. And I moved to Chicago in 82 and I took a class at the Players Workshop of Second City, improv comedy, which turned into a screenwriting class. Um, and then when I moved to California in 84, I started taking screenwriting seminars up and down the coast for about 10, 15 years. So I was always interested in this, but you know, I started out as a journalist and we would write articles. And you know what we didn't call them? Heroes' journeys. You know what we did call them? Stories. So I was writing stories for a living before I had any notion of persuasion stories or heroes' journey stories. I've been doing it a long time. And um, about 20 years ago, I spoke for the first time at a story conference about persuasion stories. And there were... I think 35 other speakers, everyone else was talking about narrative stories, heroes, journey stories, Hollywood stories, movie stories, and some academic stuff. But I was speaking about persuasion stories. And so I've been focused on this for a long time. And of course, every time I do a copy critique, or I'm working with a client, or I'm writing copy myself, there's usually a story involved. So I guess the short answer to your question is, ever since I was eight years old. Now, when you mention stories and copy, I think of some really great copywriters. Um, and I think that when, from, from when I've seen some of the copy. I have stories called talking stories about your customer's experience which might be, you know, you wake up one day and you realize it hurts your knees when you get out of bed. And it didn't used to be that way. And you think, I know they say this is what it's like to get older, but I refuse to put up with it. That's a story. That's a whole story. I just told the story about you waking up in the morning. It's not Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, Raiders of the sore joint, but you know, it, it, it um, but I, I would definitely, but let's take maybe you now this is controversial. Not everyone agrees with it, but let's take the greatest sales letter of all time. The one that made $2 billion. That would be the wall street journal letter. Yeah. That was a story. The, the original letter was 775 words and it wasn't all story. It was a very simple story. Um, Two guys meet at a college reunion. Um, they're very much alike. 
They went to the same college. They both have families and kids. One of them's the CEO and one of them is merely a department manager. The difference, information. And then they sort of transition to the Wall Street Journal. That's it, you know? Um, if you want to make that a hero's journey story, you'd have to have the president going maybe to the Andes on a journey of exploration. And he takes ayahuasca and he gets kidnapped by bad gorillas. And then somehow he finds the good gorillas. And while he's with them, they're studying the art of war by Sun Tzu. And they beat back the bad gorillas. But when he gets back to the company, he's a little loony. And some kids come in and he thinks they're the same short beings that you see when you're on Hiawaska. And the board starts to worry about him. And his wife is not feeling good about this. And um, the financial analysts are having problems with him. And his whole life's about to blow up as well as the company. And then he remembers something from the art of war about strategy and has this one strategy, which increases the stock price by 50% in three days and doubles sales in two weeks. And then he goes to this reunion and there's this other poor schmuck who's only a department manager and he's wearing the native garb of the good gorillas. I mean, that, that's a hero's journey story. It's obviously a little ridiculous, but um, that's the difference between the two. Well, what are some of the other types of stories that people might want to know about or that you talk about in your book? Okay, so <clears throat> remember when I was um, talking about, um, you know, the, the joint pain. That's um, called a story about what your prospect is experiencing. There are origin stories, and there are different types. People think usually there's one type of origin story. I've identified four. Um, one that people don't think about is a discovery story. It's really the origin of a particular invention or of a particular awareness. Um, there are stories that predict the future. There are reassurance stories. Um, predicted transformation stories. That's another story that predicts the future. Stories about how others have made it work. If you have a product that's difficult in people's imagination, they can think, huh, I, I don't know if I could actually make this work. If I, I'd like it, I'd like to buy it, but I don't know if it's going to work for me. Tell a story about how someone else made it work. That's that's another kind of persuasion so story. There's, if, you, if you're doing a sales letter or you're doing a webinar, would you put in one of these stories at each point where the persuasion is important, where you want them to follow you to the next step? Absolutely. I mean, they'd be great for transitions. They're great for introducing new ideas. They're great for answering objections. They're great for um, transitioning from one section to another. Yeah, and they don't have, they can be, but they don't have to be very long. But the thing is, people won't remember your bullet point, but they will remember your story. When I was a rabbi, and it was the first time that I had a congregation, I remember getting up and giving a sermon and watching people predictably just zone out. And I did that one time, and from that point on, all I did was tell stories. I have, I mean, you see this Zoom background here, but if we were to go into the other room to my story shelves, you would see an equal number of books that are just stories that I have, storybooks that I have collected over the years because I let the stories do the heavy lifting and they don't put people on the defensive and they don't put people off. And if you tell a simple story, people remember the simple story, whereas they won't remember all of the details. Can you overdo story in your opinion? Sure. Um, I mean, you have to remember that stories, when they're really well told, um, they're going to create images in the listener's mind. 
And if they're really well told, they're, that listener is going to actually sort of bleed, not bleed, but dissolve into that world. So if you're telling a story here about a giraffe and a story here about a meat grinder and a story here about a hockey, and they're all disconnected and, and image rich, you can overwhelm people with too much. But if you're going to keep your stories focused on one thing, which is the person and what their life is going to be like with this new product, then it's almost impossible to overdo it. What are some other types of stories? Well, there are stories that build trust. And if you if you phrase a testimonial in a way that resonates with your prospect and leads to either a result or an experience that the prospect would like to have, and it, it seems legitimate, that's a story. A lot of people, they have testimonials and they just spill out a lot of words on a page. But if you shape it as a story, you put it in a sequential order, it, it sounds like a, a little slice of somebody's life. That that could be good. Um, a predicted transformation story. If there's something about what you're selling that is going to change a person's life for the better, and you can tell about someone else who went through that kind of change, either quoting them or third person talking about them and what the benefit was like, what their new world was like, that's another kind of story. Um, reassurance stories, you know, um, um, there, there are, um, oh, there, there's, there's 25 kinds I could go on and on, but that ought to give you some idea. So, um, what are some persuasion stories, real life persuasion stories that you could share? Well, let me, let me tell you one from, um, you're probably familiar with the name Ben Feldman, are you? Absolutely. <laughs> I've got his books back there. So Ben Feldman was considered the world's greatest insurance salesperson at one point. Um, he may hold the all-time record. I don't know. And I got this story he told to a reporter in the New York Times in 1978. Ben is long gone. Um, but... You know, what Ben sold was life insurance. And that's one of the hardest things in the world to sell for one reason, especially. And that is, in order for someone to buy it, they have to come to terms with the fact that they're going to die someday. Nobody really wants to face that fact. So this is a Ben Feldman story uh, um, verbatim. I was with someone a while ago and we were in his office and looking out the window. And there was a cemetery, and you could see they were digging a grave. And the remark was made, you know, they're not practicing. Wow. That is I mean, extremely um, short, to the point, and sharp. Yeah, it and 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 that's that's a persuasion story. I mean, it's not a hero's journey story. It's you know, the thing people don't realize is persuasion stories are slice of life. I mean, if you have a teenage girl, teenage girl, and, and she goes to the mall and you ask her what happened at the mall, she'll just tell you what she saw and what happened, what what she liked, what she wanted to buy, you know. The, the, those kind of um, uh, stories, they're just slices of life. And a lot of persuasion stories are um, a slice of life. Um, they're, they're not all that, um, you, you know, one, one concept I really like. <laughs> Most of the people who really sell us on stories, especially in Hollywood, they love attention. And so we call them and we call their stories show horses. 
they just love to parade around and get all the attention. I mean, you think of a story like the Ben Feldman story, not exactly a show horse. It's more of a workhorse. It's actually understated a little bit, which makes it even more powerful because he's just talking to you. You don't really, no big wind up and, you know, transformation into another world. It's just like, this is what happened. Now, can I tell you what my favorite part of your book is? Of course. My favorite part of the Persuasion Story Code is the last chapter where you summarize things and then the cheat sheet that you give. The cheat sheet is absolutely brilliant. And when I saw that you did that, it was like, okay, that's crazy. That was so good um, that you gave that. And um, it, it was powerful. You have, um, um, you really overdid it in those last two. Number one, in the summary and going deeper into the models, all, all of the models that you gave. But the cheat sheet, you basically made it possible for, for just about everybody to work on rapidly, um, I won't say becoming an overnight expert because that would not be the truth, um, but enabling a regular person to double or triple their effectiveness in telling a story very, very rapidly. Um, okay, a lot of people in on the call tonight are copywriters or um or business people um sales people in particular how are other people using these stories well i i've only heard from one salesperson so far um a guy named tim warren who has a global um, adventure travel business and he's very excited about the book. Just when he's talking to clients, uh, he, he finds that useful. Um, Stacy Button is on the call. Stacy, I, I hope I can, I'm going to tell this story and ask for forgiveness later if um, I shouldn't have. Um, Stacy uh, ordered the book, old friend, old client, ordered the book, but she has the book sent to her son's house because as she said, um, the dogs at her house have a habit of dining on the packaging from Amazon. So um, her son opened the book first and he, she showed me the text. He said he, he went crazy over it. He was so excited about it. He's a software engineer, not even in sales as, as far as I know. And he said, I'm going to use this everywhere. I'm going to buy three copies of this for the people who, who mean the most to me. That really touched my heart. I told Stacy it really made my day when she messaged me on LinkedIn. And then um, the the other um, thing I want to tell you is about Sabrina Brahm, who is an executive coach. And she has a mastermind of people in the corporate world um, who are trying to move up to director or senior vice president or whatever. She's told every one of them to buy this book and to come up with a story for their next session. I just got a phone call from her last week. And one guy who's going to his boss to ask for promotion, he was assigned to come up with a story. You could use any kind of origin story and problem solution story, about six or seven different types of stories in the book for that. So people outside of our world are finding it very valuable. I want to wrap this up. And before we go to look at someone's copy, um, why do you think stories are so effective? I would say that if it's a story, the way I define it, which means there's a person, there's something described as usually a passage through time. There's some emotion. It's visualizable. 
and it's told with a reasonable degree of coherence, then then I, I think what happens is um, what what happens is we actually go to a different state of consciousness. I think that you know our I think the alpha and alpha waves percentage of our brain waves increases. I think there are neurochemical shifts. I think it's very slight and but it's trained where we're used to this. And I think as a result, we receive it differently. It affects us differently emotionally, and we remember it more. Absolutely. Let's go with the um let's go with the uh canoe. I mean, the kayak paddling sales letter, I'm going to put it in here. The homepage doesn't exist hardly, but the, the sales page for kayaking is really cool. And uh, I'd like you guys to look at it. Okay. So we're looking at somebody pivoting and whatever. How does this unique way of moving quickly give the average paddler ex extraordinary skills? Okay, David, your thoughts? Uh, Paolo did this. Is this from Paolo? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Could could you open Paolo's mic too? Paolo, hi. Hi. So, um, who are you sending to this page? I I always like to know who the prospect is. Yeah. So they're. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So they're they're already fairly familiar with the. Uh, Sea kayaking have experience, and this is for fairly serious sea kayakers who want to get uh, more, a lot more skilled. Are are they on your list? Do they already know who you are? Yeah, yeah, they are on my list, and they they're familiar with me. But uh, they want to. And and have you talked with them before, or do you email them a lot, or what's their level of knowing you? Um. Yeah, it's kind of mixed. Some of them probably won't know me that much. Some of them have been on my list for a while and know me okay. a lot more. Can I get you to speak up a little bit, Paolo? Sure. Yeah, okay. And then um, what what do you think in terms of the way um, their their experience in the kayak, what do you think their their biggest desires or or frustrations, unmet desires are, not just in terms of what you're doing, but in terms of what they know how to do, don't know how to do, have been stuck doing, have been able to do? Uh, well, their main uh, thing is uh, that they want to be comfortable paddling in ways without the fear of capsizing. Okay. And another one is going fast enough to keep up with their friends. Okay, good. And how does this product help them with that? Yeah, well, this unique way of moving is really a key thing in being uh, having the skills to be stable in ways. Okay, and, also, and and how does it help them in terms of speed or keeping up with friends? Yeah, for speed, it's also the key for speed because it gets your pelvis moving and gives you more power. Okay, most, good. Most sea kayakers. I kind of have their pelvis locked in. So what I teach them is to unlock their pelvis so they can, you know, oh, okay. and pelvis to add some the power. And and that's something probably that they're not going to be able to figure out from the sales page, how to unlock their pelvis. Because I, I understand that makes a big difference. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, Yeah, the, this this sales page is mostly focused on uh, getting the, the the stability. All right. So one of the things, if if stability is on their mind, then I would probably suggest that you know, right right out of the box, uh, you talk about stability, and um, you know, uh, your days of uh, your, your 
the days you fear capsizing uh, can be over, something like that. Um, if that's their big fear and you have a way to um, help them uh, uh, avoid it or, um, you know, make it go away completely, I would lead with that. And See, you, you have the headline here. Unique way of moving quickly give the average paddler extraordinary skills. When is the last time that a kayaker has come to you, Paolo, and said, I'm really looking for extraordinary skills? Yeah, nobody said that. I invented that. <laughs> okay. And yeah, but but they are looking for faster. They are looking for, as you said, stability. They are looking for afraid they might capsize and being stable even in waves. If those are what you are promising them and that's what they really want, you want to be upfront with them. The average time that someone spends on a, on a website is about six seconds. And if they don't see what they want, they may quickly, quickly be gone. So what David is saying is, take the stuff that he distilled from you that this is what they want and be upfront with it so they know, ha, huh, they breathe a sigh of relief. I am on the right page. This is talking to me instead of extraordinary skills. Back to you, yeah. David. Yeah, and let's stay let's stay at the top for a second. Um, could you scroll it all the way back down so you can see the entire? Thank you. Okay, so you've got that um, image there. What you might want to do is have a split screen, and if you could have a video on the left hand side of a guy in a kayak capsizing, maybe in slow motion. Ah! And on the right-hand side, um, paddling confidently with his friends. Ah! So, and and you could put like a red slash through the capsizing part. That will instantly tell them what it's about. No more of this. Now you'll have this. That'll get you off to a much better start. That'll that that's something. You know, Harlan, you were asking about what stories do. What pictures do is they send a lot of information very very quickly but it's got to be real simple information and a so, before and after very simple so people aren't going to get that this is necessarily related to this it's not all that clear it's clear to you it may be clear to us but as my grandmother used to say people are stupid and um, you need to be completely upfront and let them know what you are, um, what you are talking about and what they're going to get. Yeah, and let, let me let me make another comment, Harlan, just about the headline in the picture. Um, what you did is perfectly good for somebody who understands what you're about and has already talked with you and understands your thinking and, and understands the benefits. And then, then says, but Paolo, how do we do this? How do, how do I act? But that's not where they are when they get here. Even if you've explained it to them in emails, that's not where they are. Where they are is I want stability and I want speed. So you've got to meet them where they are. This, this is a little too far down the learning curve, what you're showing here. And, and never assume that because they've been following you for a while that they know this. It's all about the basics, repeating again and again what they want, their uh, benefits. Uh, before I show you how it's woven into everything you do with your kayak, let me share how I discovered it. Um, these are... These are unclear. These two sentences are unclear to me um, ab about what you're saying. I think you need to be more explicit 
in what's going to happen to them. Yeah, let um, me let me let me make a comment about that, Harlan. What I think you're doing, Paolo, again, I think the the problem is you're assuming too much familiarity and you're answering advanced questions because you're stacking two big ideas into one headline. This skill of moving, which will help you avoid capsizing and help you speed up, this skill is woven into everything, everything you do. That's a big idea, number one. Big idea, number two, is here's how I discovered this big skill. Whoa, I already capsized just reading that. Just kidding. I didn't capsize. I did. Okay. Okay. So, um, so when you show this and they do this, you're assuming and you're forgetting my grandmother's lesson that people are stupid. You're assuming they're going to look at these two and figure out what they're doing that's different. And they may not do that. So they may be going, okay, so he's rocking side to side and that's not good. And he's falling over backwards. Okay. Never assume what people are going to take away from this. That's the thing. That's that's one of the skills that David has is that when he's looking at copy, he even if David were the world's leading kayaker and uh, went out to um, uh, what's the what's the prison near not far from you the island? Uh, oh, uh, Alcatraz. Yeah, even if David got in a kayak and kayaked out to Alcatraz. Um, he would still approach this what with what we call a Zen brain, a beginner's brain, and look at it and wonder how other people are looking at this. It's you have to remove yourself from who you are and be able to go into the mind of your beginner audience and um and do that um that's where you really connect David? yeah yeah that, that that's a that's a great point harlan and i think one way of doing that is let me ask you okay so paolo let me ask you what's the difference between what the guy is doing on the top and what he's doing on the bottom what are the, what's the difference yeah the difference is the the one on the bottom is shifting his pelvis, his pelvis. And twisting the, the spine. And and, in, and in terms of the paddle, is that affecting the motion of the paddle? Yeah. So, yeah, because of the twisting, the paddle ends up more uh, towards the back of the kayak instead of uh, 90 degrees to the kayak. Okay. So one thing you could do that I think is perfectly legitimate. Oh, Harley, you want to hold on, on those two pictures for just a sec? Um, is you could boil it down to that one critical thing, not the pelvis and the spine, but you could say, because this guy knows how, knows the Paolo method, is it the Paolo? It is now. The Paolo method, um, um, his paddle is hitting the water at 90 degrees, which leads to maximum speed and maximum stability. This guy is does not know the Paolo method. He's doing what most kayakers do. And so his paddle is going behind. Everyone can understand that and visualize that. And, you know, you might even have a little drawing underneath the words, like almost like a mechanical, like an engineering drawing or an architectural drawing where you could show the, you could just draw the boat ahead and the angle of the paddle going into the water. So I can instantly visualize Oh shit, I'm not moving the paddle right and it's going too far back behind me. Like, like you know, the the second guy. Um, because then I don't need to know anything about kayaking to see. And then you can tell me why it's dangerous 
to go larger than 90 degrees. But a as it is now, man, I got to do a lot of mental work to even guess what you're talking about. Okay. I don't want to go all the way through because I think you've gotten some of the hint, but similarly, like, I'm looking at, like, are you deliberately capsizing here? I'm not sure what's going on. Why yeah, the, just, Why is I that mean, a good thing that he's doing that? Is that a yeah, bad I'm demonstrating thing? demonstrating the same movement that I did in the kayak. Uh, but, but I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about what you're saying, like it's fixed in your mind when you say you're demonstrating the same movement, is he doing a good movement here or a bad movement here? Oh, got it. Yeah. Well, what's he doing? Yeah, that's the good movement. Yeah. The one on the top or the one on the bottom? Uh, well, they're basically the same. He's one recovering from tipping over, right? Yeah, one is in the kayak and one is, uh, you know, Showing it outside the kayak, but it's the same movement. And but understand that to someone who is not an expert, they're not going to know. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Thanks. So, um, now that you've heard David tonight, what do you think you could add to? your sales letter that might improve it well i'm gonna add uh, exactly what he said uh, change the headline okay and and use that uh, those two uh, and and what else i'll give you a hint it begins with the letter s stories yeah, stories stories. <laughs> stories will make it infinitely more readable. David, anything to to wrap this up here? Yeah, I think you should tell two really simple stories, maybe even oversimplify for the uh, really sophisticated kayaker. One about how you discovered it. That's a discovery story. And then um, one about, have you taught this to anyone? Has Do you have any success stories from students yet? Oh, yeah, lots, yeah. Okay, tell one about somebody who always used to capsize and and he always had to eat at the kid's table because he could never keep up with the grown-ups out in the water. And then when he learned your method, he didn't capsize anymore. And he now he's the leading Bowman, Roman, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I can see that. I can see a picture of that story in my mind already. I don't know if it's true, but if you have one like that, it's true. It's a good idea to use true stories um, for reasons we get into in the book. Um, but um, yeah, I'd use those stories for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I have lots of stories. Yeah. I'll throw those in. Good. Well, thanks so much. That, that was awesome. Thank. You're welcome. All right. So I am putting the link one more time in there for David's book. It is available on Amazon. If you're like me and has been threatened with divorce, if you bring home just another copy, I have mine on my Kindle. Um, no more print books uh, for me. Um, and well, there are some exceptions, um, but this is on my Kindle. It's on the top of my Kindle list. Um, but folks, first of all, David, thank you very much. Jim, okay. thank you for organizing all of that so that we were ready and, and could help Paolo with that. Um, thank you all for being here. We hope you gained from it. I gained from it, even though I've already read the book, hearing David dramatize the, the waitress part was truly inspiring. Folks, thank you so much for being here. Get the book. We've put the link in about four times. I want to say if I'm the same way about books, but 
if you must have a paper copy, this is what it looks like. Very nice looking book. That's what I got. Yeah. Arriving Wednesday. Ah, thank you, Dean. You're welcome. I can't thank you for writing it. Take care. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a Bye, great guys. night. Bye.